Hello, my name is Wade Nomura, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. Recently, I had the opportunity to travel down to Mexico and do a water project. Actually, it was uh, implementing or initiating a new water project. This project is going to be done in the city of Tototlan, Jalisco. And what's unique and fascinating about this project is it's the very first project, global grant project, that this club has ever done. The club is five years old and recently just started uh, their business. And so I wanted to bring you in and have you take a look at what it takes to actually implement a water project because this is the groundwork. We won't see the finished product until sometime next year, but for this program, I wanted to show you what is the planning process and what it takes to actually put something like this in place. So um, come along with me. The first picture is gonna be a picture I have of a group that met me actually in Guadalajara, which is the area closest to the city of Tototlan. Now, the group uh, that people that you see there, four of them are Rotarians, and the gentleman in the center is actually a comedian uh, he's a TV celebrity, and one of the TV celebrities, uh, I guess, in Guadalajara, he's uh, nationally famous, and so we had our picture taken with him. And I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe his name was Freddie, and uh, my apologies because I've never seen him on TV before. Uh, he didn't show up here in the United States. But the rest of the group were all Rotarians. This group is a fairly small group of Rotarians. The club itself is uh, about, uh, I would say, about 11 or 12 members strong. The next picture you'll see is a picture of the resort, and this is where they kept me for the, the weekend. Actually, it was a long weekend, about four days I was in this area. And the picture shows us um, meeting, this is a breakfast meeting, and we're talking about the processes and where we need to go, what we need to visit, and what we'll actually be looking for as we do the project itself. You'll notice that a lot of our meetings, especially in Mexico, are done around meals, and the reason for that is there's not a lot of time uh, put aside to where you can actually sit down, discuss items, things like that, because the rest of the time we are constantly on the go. The uh, picture that you'll see next is the picture of the city of Tototlan itself. The population there is between 17,000 and 18,000 people. And as you see in the picture, it looks fairly nice. It's actually a very new um, look to it itself. The city of Tototlan used to be pretty rustic. I've, I've been there quite a few times, and this is one of the upgrades and new models that they put forward into it. The trees that line the street um, doesn't happen everywhere. This is the main street coming in, but it was a real nice touch, and I, I actually thought that um, they had done quite a bit. Before that time, this was actually a dirt road that we went into and uh, did a little bouncing around to try and get to the place. The next picture we have is the picture of the clubhouse. And this clubhouse was donated um, by one of the members of the club itself. When I say donated, he owns the land, he owns the property and the building itself. He rents the top floor and then the bottom floor is actually used as a meeting place for the Rotary Club. In Mexico, oftentimes you will see this as a process. It's either uh, meetings are done in restaurants or on occasions like this, they have what's called a salon or an area where they have a house with a bottom room vacant and they have their meetings in that place. This is um, outside the area of Totolan, just slightly outside of the city, but again, a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, venue that they have, and they do meetings once a week. The next picture we have is the downtown area of Totolan. This is an evening picture, and they're preparing for a festival. This festival goes for eight days, and the population grows from 17, 18,000 people all the way up in excess of 50,000 people a day, so you could imagine what it's like. The businesses shut down, the school shut down, everything shuts down so they can have these parties. Uh, and this was the night before it was actually ready to happen. The next picture is some of the street vendors. And you will find that the street vendors line all of these uh, streets. They go for blocks. Sometimes these uh, streets are shut down for maybe four or five blocks towards the center of town. Nobody could come in or out with the exception of being able to walk in, and that's about it. And uh, the people here come in from all over the area. Most of them come in from Guadalajara. Some come in from the uh, city of uh, Mexico, Mexico City itself. But these uh, vendors actually participate and travel around um, the state and most of Mexico itself, also doing this as part of their living. So um, you'll see that there's a lot of street vendors, uh, a lot of things being sold there. And I bring this picture forward and these ideas because the population does grow, and um, it's limited as far as hotel accommodations, things like that. Most of the people will come in on a daily basis from Guadalajara, which is about, oh, about 45 minutes away. The next picture we have is a picture of uh, what I call the tequila tent. 
and it looks to you, as it did to me, an actual building. This building is actually a temporary structure. They put the brick in place, they brick mortar the whole thing in, bring in the walls, bring in the glass, bring in the doors, and it looks just like a building, except for it's built right in the middle of a street that comes into town. So uh, you can see that the uh, process and the party is fairly elaborate. This building itself is probably about two garages in size, and they host and have parties there during the, the uh, eight days or nine days of the festival. Now uh, that you got a kind of a flavor of Tototlan, um, what I'm going to do now is actually walk you into the process of where we're going to go because we spent one entire day actually hiking through and taking a look at where the project was initiating. In other words, the origin, the source of the water, and to walk down there into all the way into the city and see what the contaminants are, what the potential issues might be from beginning a water source all the way down to where it comes into the households. So the first picture I have here shows um, a water system. Actually, this is piped water that's coming in from two different streams. As you can see, there's two different inlets into this tank of water. One of them is fairly clean. The second one is uh, a little bit more turbid or dirty. Um, that's because of some of the contamination. These are coming in from two different uh, rivers, two different streams that are coming in from two different mountain regions or creeks. And uh, the first one that we're going to walk up the hill is the one that we feel has the most potential. It's actually serving the most water into this community. So we walked up a ways, about a quarter of a mile, and the next picture shows the actual reservoir. This reservoir is a collecting area, and it was actually used for desilting also, because um, during the rainy season, as the water comes rushing down, it brings with it a lot of silt, a lot of debris, and before that can go into the pipes, it has to be, um, I would say, sorted out. And so that's what this became, was actually a silt tank. The next picture of that silt tank um, shows internally what they're using. It's a filter sock over a pipe, a uh, porous pipe. And as you can see by the picture, it's already pretty dirty. And this was the cleanest time of the year. This was uh, their dry season. So that water has now been kind of uh, cleaned out. Most of the water coming down from the mountain is fairly clean and you can see the results. Uh, the residue on that one oftentimes plugs it. There's enough silt coming down there where it actually fill up that entire reservoir. So that's why we had to take a look at it. The next picture shows us, again, taking a look at that same reservoir. Uh, as you can see, it's fairly large, not that deep, maybe four, four feet deep, maybe five feet deep. And um, we're trying to decide how we can get more silting uh, collection out of that. The next picture is the tank itself, what you're taking a look at. And this is the system where it actually starts the pumping down into the village itself, or the city, the city of Tototlan. I put this picture there because this is kind of the structure, how it's worked. Most of the areas in Mexico all have these pump stations and collecting areas. And then from there, gravity would feed it into the city. The next picture again shows um, the entrance and those, that cage effect is actually what stops the branches, things like that, from coming into the reservoir. The next picture you see is a dry one, and this one actually is upstream about, oh, 200, 300 yards. What's unique and fascinating about this one, even though it looks the same, this was actually designed to be a silting tank. And inside that tank, there are chambers, um, I would say little square troughs that were perpendicular to the flow of water. And as water comes across that, those, the silt drops into these little areas and then can be scooped out eventually to where it keeps it clean that way. It is not in function or in use right now, and I asked them why, and they said actually they had no idea why. So uh, we had to go up the stream a little bit farther to find out the answer. What we found, again, and the next picture shows uh, the wall uh, that was being constructed with the stream coming underneath it. This was the issue. The water had actually undermined the reservoir itself, and so the water, instead of being channeled and diverted into this, uh, the silting tank, was actually going underneath the wall and fo following uh, a creek bed that was perpendicular or parallel to the system itself. So what we have to do now is take a look at actually stopping that, co uh, collecting the water to where the water would then flow towards the silting tanks, and that would resolve a major portion of the issue. And the sock item that we saw before that would now become pretty much obsolete. We wouldn't need that in place because the silting tank would be able to handle just about all of that. Above that reservoir that you're taking a look at, I took a picture of the water. This is uh, the way the water looks. As you can see, it's uh, fairly clear. 
it's good quality water. We had it analyzed and tested. We found out that it was uh, pretty much 99% uh, clean. It was ready to drink at that point in time because there had been no contaminants put into this water. Um, you'll see also that it's pretty clear. And the reason for that, again, this is the dry season. As we get into the rainy season, then uh, we would have a lot of rock uh, boulders even coming down this riverbed. So we had to control that or take care of how we're going to address that issue. The next picture I have is a picture, and I wanted to show you this because this was my two and a half mile hike up the mountain. Uh, we took this area, and uh, they didn't tell me that this hike was actually going to be that strenuous. They said, Wade, do you hike? I said, sure, I hike you know, quite a bit. I do easy five, ten miles a day hiking or walking around. They said, good, you'll be ready for this. We're going to go on a little hike. We want to take a look at the water source. What they failed to tell me is that we were actually walking through a, a, a jungle. And at that jungle, um, the problem that we had there is that uh, I was dressed in street clothes. I had slacks on. I had uh, loafers on. And I had a dress button-down shirt. Well, at the end of this uh, five-mile walk, I would say, uh, the shirt was pretty tattered, had a little bit of blood on it. And, uh, the pants were pretty stained. And the shoes had let me down probably four times. I had slipped down probably three or four little hills in the process of that one. So uh, again, I, it probably would have been nice if they told me to be prepared for a little bit of wilderness hiking. The next picture shows um, in line a picture of a water source. This is the actual water source coming down the mountain. You notice in there there's a little bit of water, not a lot. This was actually a hole that we found in one of the pipes. And because of that, uh, we had to do a regular walk. And we found there were a number of other areas where this is occurring, and that's why one of the pressure factors had dropped down so much. The next picture I have is a picture of the creek or the river itself in an upper area. This was another collecting area, and as you can see, uh, there's a lot of vegetation on it. It's actually kind of a, a moss that was growing on top of that that has to eventually be cleaned off. And so that is one of the areas where, again, we would have to address. Most likely in this situation, we would be piping down, solid piping, all the way to the desilting area, which would then relieve a lot of the issues that we see with this picture here. The next picture is the top. This is the two and a half mile hike that we ended up at. This is a tank that was about eight to 10 feet off the ground. Um, it's a cylinder tank with a cap. The picture shows a gentleman walking on top of the cap, and this is where he ended up eventually getting to. And you'll see down in the, uh, down below, there's people walking up. Well, I got to tell you another story about this one, uh, since I have a little time here. Um, to get on top of the tank itself, you had to shimmy up a section of, uh, it was a fallen uh, tree, a uh, tree trunk. And you would shimmy up this, walk up this tree trunk, up onto this, and then you would actually have to walk over then the ravine, crevice, creek, whatever, which is about eight feet down. So we walked up no problem. Walking back, however, and why I've got these pictures, I, I carry a professional camera, and it's about six pounds. Well, walking down, I snagged that camera on a twig, not thinking I yanked it to break it off the twig and ended up falling into that creek bed. Uh, fortunately, I landed on my feet um, and saved the camera in the, in the process. But uh, it was, that was part of the adventure, I would say. Uh, the group felt pretty, uh, they were worried, they were concerned that I had gotten hurt two and a half miles back to the road, but I was fine. And I didn't want to share that with you because this is part of the hazards of the, the job that they give me. The next picture uh, is a picture of the top of the tank. And at top of the tank, you'll see a trap door on it. The gentlemen that you see around us are um, two of the people are from the water committee. Uh, community. They work for the municipality. And the other uh, gentlemen, the other four, are actually Rotarians. The gentleman that you see in the center with the, uh, with the broad brim hat is actually, his name is Nacho, and believe it or not, he actually worked for me and my company back uh, probably 30, 40 years ago, so um, we go back a long ways. The other gentleman, Jose Luis Temores, his father actually worked for the company, for my father also, so we had a, a pretty good bond, and one of the reasons why we worked in Tototlan, uh, Jalisco itself. Now that trap door opens up into um, the actual water source itself, which uh, I found quite fascinating. Uh, the next picture that you'll see is what it looked like once that door was open. There was a metal staircase that went down, actually it was a ladder that went down into this thing about 10 feet down. And um, they said, well, Wade, why don't you go inside there, take a look at it, and let's get some pictures. Because the water is actually coming out of the rock, and it's volcanic. In other words, this water actually is steaming. It was warm. So I jumped down into this thing, uh, figuring, well, probably pretty safe. 
As I walked down into this thing, I noticed it was like a sauna in there. It was extremely hot because this was actually volcanic water coming out. Uh, this water was tested. We found it to be very pure, and believe it or not, it had very low mineral content. So it was safe to drink at that point with the exception of it being warm. Um, the pictures, the next picture that you see is one of the outlets where the water is actually coming in through a crevice in the stone inside of this tank. The next picture is another picture, one of the other areas. There's about three actual areas where the water is coming in through the rock and collecting in this tank. Now, during um, high time of the year, that tank will actually be filled with water, why they made the metal staircase for. Uh, but this time it was fairly low, and so um, it was uh, accessible, I would say. The next picture shows the, the water engineer actually uh, showing a sample of that water. Uh, we collected that water. That water is going to go back and be reevaluated. Um, but that water, uh, we, again, we found to be um, edible or, or drinkable. It was a very good tolerance, something we could drink on. The next trip we took, we went all the way back down the two and a half miles, and we followed then up the other creek bed to see what we had in store for us there. That was about a, a mile and a half hike. And that one there was an area where they had more people living, uh, more farming going on, and that water was contaminated. Uh, we had a lot of bacterial, um, biological contaminants, along with some uh, mineral content contamination also. So we went to um, pretty much the head source of that water supply, where that pipe was then being initiated in. And you'll see a dam in this picture here. The next picture will show a top view of that same dam. Um, and it shows how the water has been actually dammed off. Now remember, this is the um, dry season, and so and this is already maxed out. And that was one of the other reasons why this system would overflow and then run down into the other reservoirs that we had down below. So we had to address that, and we'll probably end up putting in another substantial piping system into that as opposed to having it overflow into the creek bed itself and intrude into the water source. The next picture, we headed back to town. We spent most of that day hiking around. Now we're getting late. This is probably about 6 o'clock or so in the afternoon, in the evening. And uh, this is the center of town, and this is where the water is actually going to be piped into. It's probably about, I would say, 6 miles, 7 miles from the actual area we were hiking in. And this is where the water will be piped into, and from this area, it will be distributed within the city itself. This is the area where we would be putting in a filter system. This filter system will remove all the other silting elements and actually have an injection, a chlorine injection system into it to clean that out. That would then become 99.9% .9 clear or pure for our households to use. This source of water will supply 70% of the people in Tototlan. So roughly 14,000 people will benefit from this water project. The water project, by the way, will cost us about $36,000. Um, that's going to be initiated by the Rotary Club of Carpinteria along with the uh, Rotary Club of Tototlan. So that's going to be the partnering groups. There will be a number of other clubs participating in, but that's actually how we get these projects coordinated. Cash, uh, cash input into the project will be about $10,000. Uh, the other uh, $26,000 will come from matching grants from the Rotary Foundation, and this is uh, matured income from previously. The next picture you see is a picture of the pump. It's, it's a current pump. It's one of the pumps that um, will probably be replaced with the filter system and a new pump put in place on that one. The next picture we show is a newer installation, um, a just different location. Again, uh, this is a brand new well that had just been put in within the last year or so. That's why the system looks so nice. It's caged in for security reasons, even though um, I found most of these areas, they're pretty safe. They, they just do that as precautionary. This one here, uh, when I say a uh, pump, there's actually wells throughout the city itself. And most of those actually, as they're pumped up from the well, will actually have their own filtration systems in it, inclusive. So um, those will be put into the other rest of the water. That would be the 30% that would be missing from the 70% of the total system. Now, what else is unique, and I want to show you this next picture. This is at the household of one of the neighborhoods in the city of Tototlan itself. It was working off well water. Uh, the well water had, at this point had not been filtered. And because of that, they found an unusual situation, something I had never seen before. You see the picture, the gentleman here is actually taking water out of the, uh, the water spigot. 
that water appeared to be very clear. Even though it was uh, questionable, the quality was probably 92, 93% safe, but even so, there's some contaminants in there. Now, they put a, uh, in place a tool, and this tool actually fits onto the water hose, and because it's a gravity-fed system, they actually were able to agitate back into the line with a pump and push this water back down, agitating the water in the piping system itself. They removed that pump and they let the water run out. The picture that I'm showing you now is uh, in that bottle is a picture of the water that actually came out of that, that uh, hose bib. That blackness they attribute to a uh, layer of carbon someplace near the well source. So uh, near the groundwater uh, in this, this uh, aquifer, I would say, it's a little bit higher than the normal uh, aquifer. It's uh, probably more of a, just a water table. Um, that is actually getting into the lines and plugging systems throughout. Now, it's causing a lot of scaling, a lot of buildup. Even though it's somewhat safe to drink, I mean, you can see uh, if you agitate it up or have a big storm, this is kind of what you end up having left over. And so I wanted to show you this one because this is one of the areas where a filter system will be put in place and also be able to help out quite a bit with uh, how we are going to address that water. The filter system itself will be placed probably in this case in another individual uh, neighborhood. The pump itself and the filter system that that water is coming out of that well seem to be um, only in that one given area, that one neighborhood probably has about seven, 800 people there. So we will put a system in that place also that will be able to remove the contaminants and hopefully, ideally, get rid of the uh, carbon buildup that's showing up from that well itself. The next picture we have is a picture of uh, us. This is the wrap up, um, end of two days actually, of walking around and, and deciding, designing and taking a look at what the needs assessments will be for this water project. The gentleman that you see in the middle, uh, sitting in the back in the middle, his name is Juan Guadalupe. Juan Guadalupe is the mayor of the city of Tototlan. We are meeting uh, in an area right near um, Lake Chapala. So um, they had uh, fish for us to eat, things like that, very unique, uh, very, uh, I would say, kind of customary for that, for that area, region itself. So what we had were some fried fish, looked like minnows, fried minnows. We had another, other types of uh, fish, um, tilapias, things like that, that actually came out of that lake itself. So a uh, pretty, pretty unique, pretty interesting uh, meal. Um, they all seemed to enjoy it. Uh, it wasn't all that bad, but you'll notice uh, the table, my plate's a little cleaner than the rest of theirs. I did some sampling. I didn't know if I was into 100% of being able to eat all that stuff. But um, meeting with the um, mayor, uh, Juan Guadalupe, one of the things we found out, and by the way, Juan Guadalupe is a member of the Rotary Club of Tototlan also. Having him involved with it, um, at one point creates what the Rody Foundation would consider a conflict of interest. In other words, it would be something financially where he could kind of promote this to help his position. However, um, if he signs that, that conflict of interest is something he is aware of and he will step away from any of those processes, uh, would then make it, put it back into conformance. Having uh, Juan Guadalupe in place was one of those really beneficial areas because as you saw from the pictures before, there's a lot of construction and work that has to be done from the damming of the water that's going underneath that wall to the uh, cleaning out of the silt tanks, bringing in the piping um, and bringing it directly into the filtration systems that would then come into the city will all be handled by the municipality. And that was one of the reasons why we were looking at a $36,000 budget because literally we will only be paying for the filters themselves. And that is one of the big advantages of having people on the ground working with you. I'd also like to share that when you look for opportunities and working with clubs, you want to be sure that you have this partnership, this partnership agreement, because it's best to work with friends, among friends, and be able to trust 100%. Everything and anything that needs to be done will be done by friends and that group that's of that Rotary family. Um, this Rotary Club of Tototlan, again, I said was about five years old. I was approached by a gentleman, uh, his name is Adan Perez Salazar, who used to be a foreman, and he was the one that taught me Spanish. He moved back uh, to his hometown of Tototlan, became uh, mayor of the city, this is uh, quite a few years ago, and at one of my trips down into Mexico, when I was uh, visiting, I believe it was Pátzcuaro, he came in and visited me, and he said, why don't you do projects 
in my city, city of Tototlan. We're like family, and you should be helping us out. My answer was, you don't have a Rotary Club. Unless you have a Rotary Club, we can't do a water project, or we can't do any project with you because we need to have a host club. Um, a year and a half later, he called me back and goes, hey, Wade, uh, that Rotary Club, it's done. We're ready for you. We're waiting for you. So um, that is one of the ways to create these partnerships is to actually even go in there and build clubs. Uh, that club, in, at, since that time, has been very active, doing a lot, benefiting the community. Uh, it's not just this water project, but it's everything that they do to help out that community. And they're very well known in that community. And because of that, they have the mayor of the city, they have uh, the chief of police. A lot of people that are tied into the municipality are actually working here in this club. And that's why I say Rotary as a family. You can find family anywhere in the world, anywhere, any, everywhere. There are certain needs, specific needs. Even here in Santa Barbara, we have needs that could be met and addressed. But by having international partners, we open up the world of the global grant because the global grant has to be done with an international partner. And in order for that to be successful, you have to have trust at both ends. And that's why um, this is what I do. Um, I, I run around the, mostly in Mexico, but also other areas of the world to try and find those friendships, create those partnerships, and be able to find those haves and needs, what people have that want to be able to benefit into and those that have the need and how we can partner up with people that have something with those that need something. When we look at water projects, we have to look at sustainability. Actually, all projects, at global grant projects, we look at sustainability as the number one component. This project will be around for 20, 30 years because this system that we will be putting in place, we know will have the, um, the ability to main be maintained and sustain that type of life. The other thing we take a look at is the, um, the benefit. In other words, we need to have a baseline study done. So this is what they're doing right now. We need to know something that's measurable. So we have to know how the people are living right now, how many people are sick, what the income, average income is, the income per household, the, the cost of living, and then by doing that and knowing what's up front, at the end of that, we would be able to then address and be able to actually measure our successes as we do these global grant projects. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. This is uh, one of the areas where I, I really enjoyed it. For me, it's been a lifelong experience, something I will continue doing for as long as I can. But with that, I wanted to share with you part of doing a grant. Well, thank you very much for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this, and we hope to see you next time. So until then, thank you.